here is your latest African news. Chad. Chad starts national dialogue to pave way for elections. Delayed talks on Chad's future that the ruling military says are a decisive moment open despite some opposition groups boycotting the gathering. More than 1,400 delegates from the military, civil society, opposition parties, trade unions and rebel groups gathered on August 20th in the capital N'Djamena for the national dialogue that is expected to last three weeks. Military government ruler Mahamat Debi has said the forum should open the way to free and democratic elections after 18 months of rule by his military, a deadline that France, the African Union, AU and others have urged him to uphold. But the dialogue, which should have begun in February, has been marred by delays as Chad's married rebel groups meeting in Qatar squabbled over whether to attend. In the end, about 40 groups on August 8th signed a deal entailing a ceasefire and guarantees of safe passage on return to Chad. On the agenda for the talks are lasting peace, reforming state institutions and a new constitution that will be put to a referendum. Nigeria Nigerian activists concerned as secular court upholds Islamic court trial for blasphemy. Supporters of free speech in Nigeria are expressing concern after a federal court last week ruled that a singer appealing his death sentence for blasphemy must have his case retried in a Sharia court. Yahaya Aminu Sharif's lawyer argued his case should be tried in a secular court and challenged the legality of Nigeria's Islamic courts, which critics say threaten free speech. But the Kano State Appeals Court ruled 2 to 1 that Islamic law does not violate the National Charter and that Islamic courts have jurisdiction to try blasphemy cases. The ruling dismissed a challenge filed by Sharif's lawyer, Kola Alapini, questioning the legality of the death sentence. One of the judges, Abu Bakr Muwazu Lamido, said the challenge was not backed by law and that it was more out of sentiment. An Islamic court in Kano sentenced Sharif to death in August 2020 for allegedly circulating a song that blasphemed the Muslim prophet Muhammad on social media. In November, the Kano High Court overruled the sentence and ordered a retrial at the Sharia court, stating that Sharif did not have any legal representation during his trial. Sharia is more dominant across the 12th northern Nigerian state, with a strong base in Kano. Critics say they worry the ruling could encourage overzealous believers to take mob actions against alleged blasphemers. South Africa South Africa's Zulu nation celebrates a new king. Thousands of South African Zulus celebrated the coronation of their new king in a rural part of the KwaZulu-Natal province in August 20th. Misuzulu Kazolithini was crowned a year and a half after his father Goodwill Zolithini passed away from COVID-19. A controversial ceremony as some members of the royal family reject his nomination, preferring other siblings out of the late king's 28 children. The traditional rites included sacred moments such as the lion hunt and the entrance to the cattle kraal, a sacred place where the soon-to-be king is presented to the ancestors. President Cyril Ramaphosa recognized the 47-year-old king as heir to the throne and should later in the year certify the crowning. If the king of the country's largest ethnic group has no executive power, he holds great moral authority over its more than 11 million people. Zimbabwe Racism storm as transport company boss calls black employees lizard-skinned. The chief executive officer of one of Africa's leading fuel supply and distribution companies, Strauss Logistics Zimbabwe, has been caught up in a racism storm for calling his black employees lizard-skinned. The allegation has created tension between Adrian Smart and his employees, who are mainly truck drivers. It is also alleged that the workers are not being paid and have lost all labor cases against the employer who allegedly brags about being connected and that no one will touch him. In June this year, the workers embarked on an industrial action but the move has turned sour for them after the same judge granted Smart's permission to punish his employees for embarking on the job action. 
Smart, through his company, rushed to court challenging the strike, arguing that it was illegal. The matter was handled by Justice Musariri, who, according to the employees, controversially handles all labor disputes between them and their employer. The judge ruled in favor of Smart, stating that the respondents, workers, did not dispute their failure to comply with the stated requirements. The chairperson of the Workers' Committee has deposed an affidavit on behalf of the employees challenging the labor court action by the employer. He told the court that he was unfairly stopped from driving his truck together with the committee's secretary. They were put on suspension pending disciplinary hearing. Last week, over 200 drivers were called for a disciplinary hearing over the industrial action after the company was given permission to punish the employees. The workers were, however, aggrieved that a new workers' committee was selected when the current one had not been dissolved. Nigeria Nigeria to revoke licenses of 52 media outlets Nigeria's broadcasting regulator on August 19th announced it will revoke the licenses of 52 media organizations over unpaid fees in a move the country's journalist union says is ill-advised. The head of the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, Malam Balarale Ilela, announced the decision at a news conference in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The affected stations owe the commission a combined 6.2 million US dollars, the commission said. In a press release, the NBC said it published a list of media companies owing license fees in May and gave the organizations a grace period to pay the debt and avoid having licenses revoked. Those who had not paid were ordered to shut down operations in the next 24 hours. Included on the list are about 20 state government media outlets, including some belonging to the ruling All Progressives Congress or APC party. Nigeria's Union of Journalists described the move as hasty and ill-advised. In a statement, the union president, Chris Isiguzo, said the Broadcasting Commission had failed to take action on the economic reality in Nigeria and noted that some unpaid fees dated back to 2015. The heads of some of the affected stations requested more time to pay their dues, citing a tough economic climate. The Broadcasting Commission announced some a few weeks after the regulator fined four Nigerian stations in connection with their coverage of insecurity. Diaspora Cuba bids for foreign investment to tackle goods shortages. Cuba says it will allow foreign investors into its wholesale and retail trade for the first time in 60 years. The move is a major shift for the island nation's communist government and overturns a 1960s Fidel Castro policy of nationalizing retail. But Cuba is now facing its most severe economic crisis in decades with rising prices and public discontent. The policy aims to tackle shortages of basic goods like food and medicine, but stops short of fully opening trade. Government officials said that the foreign investors would be able to wholly or partially own Cuba-based wholesalers. Economy Minister Alejandro Gill said the move will allow for the expansion and diversification of supply to the population and contribute to the recovery of domestic industry. In 1969, Fidel Castro nationalized Cuba's private wholesale and retail industry. The new foreign investment bill, however, recognizes that the country's centralized government cannot resolve its essential goods shortage without investments from overseas. Diaspora Castine looks to honor local African-American history in renaming offensive islands. A committee tasked with finding replacements for a pair of controversially named islands in Castine has chosen options that won't wipe away the history of African Americans in the community. Last spring, Castine residents voted to start the process of changing the names of Upper Negro Island and Lower Negro Island, a pair of small islands connected by a sandbar in the mouth of the Bagaduce River. The town's Island Name Change Committee has been working since then to come up with new potential names and presented their recommendations to the select board. Though the islands have been collectively called Negro Islands going back to at least the late 1700s, historians have found no conclusive origin for the name. 
but the committee didn't want to erase the island's connection with African Americans, no matter how hazy their association. The committee suggested two pairings for the islands that recognize the history of African Americans and Wabanaki people in the town. One option is to rename them to Esther Island and Emmanuel Island. The second option is Jackson Island and Pidianiski Island. The community will likely hold a binding town-wide survey on the recommendations this fall and send the preferred names to the federal board. Kenya. Raila Odinga files petition to challenge Kenyan election outcome. Raila Odinga's presidential petition against William Ruto's election has finally been admitted at the Supreme Court of Kenya. Mr. Odinga, a veteran opposition leader who reigned with the backing of President Uhuru Kenyatta, has rejected the outcome of the August 9th poll, branding it as a travesty. Mr. Odinga and his running mate and co-petitioner Martha Karua are seeking 23 reliefs, including an order for the inspection of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission IEBC servers and scrutiny of the rejected and spoiled votes. They also want an order for scrutiny and forensic audit of the Kenya Integrated Elections Management Systems KEEMS kit, IEBC website and portal. The pair is also seeking an order to summon Director of Criminal Investigations George Kinoti to produce statements, photographs, reports, equipment, laptops, phones and other gadgets and any other material connected or related to the conduct of the elections and found in possession of the Venezuelan nationals arrested at a Nairobi airport. They further want Mr. Kinoti summoned and directed to produce laptops allegedly retrieved and seized from an agent of the UDA party and report on the forensic analysis and examination of the laptops and content. DR Congo DR Congo campaigners face threats over oil blocks. Environmental campaigners in the Democratic Republic of Congo on August 23rd said they had faced threats due to their opposition to last month's auction of 30 oil and gas blocks. In a statement, eight environmental groups including Greenpeace, the Rainforest Foundation and the Network for the Conservation and Restoration of Forest Ecosystems, CREF, said campaigners in DRC were facing direct threats. The group said that campaigners had received a barrage of threats on social media, including accusations of treason, death threats, and menacing anonymous phone calls. In launching the auction of licensing rights for 27 oil and three gas blocks, the Kinshasa government promised to ensure environmental norms were respected. President Felix Tshisekedi said exploration work will be carried out using the most modern technological means that protect the environment and drilling will be subject to a plan designed to minimize harmful effects on the ecosystem. But of the 27 oil blocks, nine are in the huge central basin rainforest and peatlands region in the west of the country. The plan to open up portions of the world's second biggest rainforest to allow drilling liable to release carbon into the atmosphere is controversial. Campaigners have warned that the move could have disastrous consequences for local people in an area blessed with rich biodiversity whose peatlands help to retain tens of billions of carbon deposits. A petition to end oil and gas development in the DRC that NGOs launched ahead of the auctions has attracted more than 100,000 signatories. Kenya A tea company is being ordered to stop taking legal action in Kenya to block a lawsuit in Scotland. More than 1,000 former and current employees of James Finlay Kenya Limited JFK, are suing the company for damages at Scotland's Supreme Civil Court, the Court of Session. Last month, the firm won a temporary injunction from a court in Nairobi stopping workers from pursuing the case. A Court of Session judge ruled JFK should be told to halt action in Kenya. That will allow the lawsuit in Scotland to get back on track. The workers claimed they suffered musculoskeletal injuries while working for the Aberdeen registered JFK at its firms in the Kericho region of Kenya. They have signed up to group proceedings a class action lawsuit in the court of session in Edinburgh. Having failed to stop the lawsuit from going ahead, the company opened up a second front in the legal battle by seeking an order from the Employment and Labor Relations Court in Nairobi. 
It argued that the Scottish case was an assault on the sovereignty of the people of Kenya and violated the country's constitution. The company said the proper and natural forum for a work injury dispute involving Kenyan workers governed by Kenyan law was in Kenya and not Scotland. The court granted an interim anti-suit injunction, bringing the Scottish case to a temporary halt and preventing anyone else from joining the class action. Lawyers acting for the tea pickers have now won an order from the court of session telling JFK not to continue with the Kenyan action. They argued that JFK's conduct had been calculated to intimidate the workers and prevent them from having lawful access to the Scottish courts for resolution of a bona fide dispute. East Africa Alam as Somalia's Hassan Sheikh Mohamud sours ties with Ethiopia. The new government in Somalia that won elections held in May has gotten off to a rocky political start in its relations with a relatively powerful and influential neighbor, Ethiopia. Ethiopia enjoyed warm relations with the previous government in Somalia, but recent incidents have soured relations. First was that Somalia's new president, Hassan Sheikh Mohamud, bypassed his Ethiopian counterpart, Abiy Ahmed, during visits to general capitals in May, June, and July. Then during a visit to Cairo, Hassan Sheikh warded into the controversy between Ethiopia and Egypt over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, Gerd. Egyptian ruler Abdel Fattah el-Sisi hinted at a press conference that Somalia and Egypt saw eye to eye on the contentious dam. The final stroke appears to be Hassan Sheikh's unexpected decision to appoint a former Al-Shabaab commander Mukhtar Robo Mansour to Somalia's new cabinet. Mansour was the former deputy of the militant group Al-Shabaab. This appointment was met with a mixture of shock and disbelief at home and in the region and beyond. The fiercest reaction came from Ethiopia, which dreads Al-Shabaab and its radicalized elements. Successive Ethiopian governments have always expected a menace from Somalia. Addis Ababa was nevertheless taken by surprise when Al-Shabaab launched a cross-border attack on Ethiopian forces in late July. It showed that the militant group could easily dent Ethiopia's capability to control the border with southern Somalia. Zimbabwe Gas drilling project to begin in Zimbabwe Australia-based oil and gas company Invictus Energy has said it would next month begin exploring for gas in northern Zimbabwe. If successful, this could lead to Zimbabwe's fast gas production and could ease the country's perennial power woes. Exploration was to start some 200 kilometers north of the capital Harare, near the border with Mozambique at a field that is estimated to hold 20 trillion cubic feet of gas, according to Invictus. Invictus Energy signed the exploration, development and production deal with Zimbabwe in 2018. It plans to build a gas-to-power facility to supply the national grid. But environmentalists are wary and say when the project gets into full swing, there will be serious environmental pollution and that the construction of hundreds of kilometers of pipeline will displace people as well as destroy vegetation and animal habitats. Diaspora Black America benefits from Biden signing Inflation Reduction Act. President Joe Biden has signed the historic $750 billion U.S. dollars Inflation Reduction Act into law, a major accomplishment for the administration and a Democratic Party that's now looking with more optimism towards November crucial midterm elections. The bill represents the most significant climate investment in U.S. history. It includes strengthening critical provisions of the Affordable Care Act, providing Medicare with authority to negotiate certain prescription drug costs, and administration officials anticipate it will create jobs with family sustaining wages. Additionally, the law will reduce the national deficit. Biden said new taxes would pay for the bill, including a 15% minimum tax on large corporations and a 1% tax on stock buyback. Overall, it's projected that the measure would result in the government taking in more than 700 billion US dollars over 10 years while spending about 430 billion US dollars to help reduce carbon emissions and securing the extension of subsidies in the healthcare law.
The new law should primarily assist African-American families. According to a study published by the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, African-American households are now exposed to inflation fluctuations than their white peers. Researchers concluded that if prices paid by white households increase by 7% over a year, calculations suggest that one may expect them to increase by 7% for black families. The study said that black households also spend a more significant portion of their income on goods and services with prices that change more often. The results, according to the researchers, is not a mystery as black families will suffer the worst effects of rising inflations because they lag behind their white counterparts in income, wealth, financial savings and home ownership. Mozambique Mozambique gets 300 million US dollars from World Bank after scandal. The World Bank on August 21st gave 300 million US dollars to Mozambique in a deal that marks the resumption of its support to the country six years after its suspended aid following a financial scandal involving the government. The funds dispersed by the multilateral organization in the form of a grant will be used for infrastructural projects to support the economy and improve the living conditions of the population, according to Mozambique's finance minister, Max Tonella. The World Bank's country director for Mozambique, Ida Swarai Ridiho, insisted that the funds allocated by his organization should come in support of structural reforms and extend the efforts undertaken in recent years to strengthen accountability and transparency in the public sector. The resumption of World Bank aid comes after the International Monetary Fund, IMF, granted its first loan to Mozambique worth 556 million US dollars in May since the so-called hidden debt scandal. This massive corruption case is linked to secret loans of 1.8 billion US dollars from foreign banks to Mozambican state-owned companies guaranteed by the state. The trial of 19 defendants all close to the government is underway in Maputo and the verdict is expected by the end of the year. Kenya Kenyans seek to sue the UK for alleged colonial abuses. A group of Kenyans have filed cases against the UK government at the European Court of Human Rights ECHR for alleged colonial abuses. These include alleged theft of land which is still being used by tea firms. The clans say the UK's alleged lack of engagement to seek redress has violated the European Convention on Human Rights. Representatives for the Talai and Kipsigis, who are originally from Kericho County, say they tried to meet the UK Foreign Secretary Liz Chus in May 2022 but were turned down. The Talai clan say its members were forcefully evicted from fertile land in the highlands of the Rift Valley to pave way for tea plantations. The Talai led the resistance against European settlement to quash it. Every member of the clan was forcefully moved to detention in the Sessafly and mosquito-infested valley near present-day Lake Victoria. The conditions there are recorded to have been so harsh that many of them died and women suffered miscarriages. They also lost their livestock in large numbers. When Kenya gained independence in 1963, the survivors left detention and returned to what they considered their ancestral land. But they never recovered it. They say they've lived alongside the tea estates as squatters ever since. A lawyer for the claimant said that they want compensation in the region of 200 billion US dollars, an apology, and to open up a new chapter of mutual respect. South Africa The Department of Education in the Eastern Cape has announced that matriculants in the province will for the first time write their trial exams in Isikosa and Sesotho. The department spokesman Malibongwe Mtima confirmed this historic move on August 23rd. Mtima said the subjects that will be translated include mathematics, physical science, life sciences, history, agricultural science and accounting. When asked what inspired this move, Mtima said the department aims to boost indigenous languages as the constitution permits. Through this initiative, the department is hoping for pupils to achieve great levels in their educational studies as it would be easier to comprehend using their home languages. He said the department is working together with the National Lexology and the Pan-South African Language Board, Pan-SALB, to successfully achieve the mandate of the initiative. 
Ntima cleared concerns around the broadness of both Isikosa and Sesotho languages when it comes to the various terminologies and concepts in the subject. He said they will use a translation system. About 800 schools in the province are participating in this initiative. He said the test-out trial has already started. Kenya UK denies meddling in Kenya presidential elections. UK High Commission Jane Marriott has dismissed claims that she and her country interfered in Kenya's recently concluded general elections. Miss Marriott was reacting to allegations on social media that she pressured the Electoral Commission to declare William Ruto as president-elect following the disputed poll. Some users shared unverified photos of her shaking hands with Mr. Ruto and the electoral body chairperson Wafula Chebukati. In a series of tweets, Miss Marriott said the UK does not support nor have a view on any candidates or parties in elections, terming the claims misinformation. Presidential candidate Raila Odinga on August 23rd urged unnamed foreign countries to cease meddling in Kenyan politics. Sudan Sudan warns of rising Blue Nile waters. A Sudanese state official has issued a warning of rising waters in Blue Nile River caused by ongoing floods. Sena State Minister of Infrastructure and Urban Development Al Mutasim Al Taher said the current situation in the country of Sinja was manageable so long as the water levels don't rise higher. He asked citizens to take precautions and raise alerts where necessary. Flooding in the Blue Nile could break the riverbanks and wreak havoc. At least 79 people have died this month alone because of heavy rains pounding the country, according to the government. Thousands of houses have collapsed as villages flooded. Cameroon Cameroon seals mining sites to prevent deaths. Authorities in Cameroon have sealed at least 30 gold mines, including some owned by Chinese, after at least 33 young miners died in landslides this month and scores more were declared missing. Officials said on August 22nd that they are also concerned about working conditions that have caused deaths within the seasonal gold mine community. A heavy downpour on August 22nd kept businesses closed in Kambele, a village in Baturi district on Cameroon's eastern border with the Central African Republic. Cameroon says Kambele is home to several thousand Cameroonians, Chadians and Central African Republic civilians either working or looking for a job in gold mines. Diaspora. Former Louisville detective pleads guilty to Breonna Taylor cover-up. A former Louisville police detective who helped falsify the warrant that led to the deadly police raid at Breonna Taylor's apartment has pleaded guilty to a federal conspiracy charge. Federal investigators said Kelly Goodlett added a false line to the warrant and later conspired with another detective to create a cover story when Taylor's March 13, 2020 shooting death by police began gaining national attention. Taylor, a 26-year-old black woman, was shot to death by officers who knocked down her door while executing a drug search warrant. Taylor's boyfriend fired a shot that hit one of the officers as they came through the door and then they returned fire, striking Taylor multiple times. Goodlet, 35, appeared in a federal courtroom in Louisville on August 23rd and admitted to conspiring with another Louisville police officer to falsify the warrant. Three former Louisville officers were indicted on criminal civil rights charges earlier this month by a federal grand jury. Goodlet will be sentenced in November 2022 and faces up to five years in prison for the conviction. Africa wide. Seven more African countries look to join South Africa in nuclear power production. At least seven African countries are at various stages of commissioning, shopping for vendors and mapping appropriate sites in the rollout of nuclear power plants as a majority eye 2030 as a start date for generating electricity from nuclear energy. Egypt, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Morocco, Nigeria and Uganda are planning on moving towards nuclear energy soon. Egypt is currently the only country to have begun construction following the formal launch of a site in July. Kenya is also inching closer to the development stage after identifying two coastal sites, Kilifi and Kwale, earlier this year to put up the country's first nuclear power generator. Uganda is also considering three sites in the Kyonga, Kangera and Aswa rivers of the construction of two 1,000 megawatt reactors by 2031. 
Nigerian Nuclear Regulator Agency opened bidding for construction of a 4 gigawatt nuclear plant in March 2022, and the country is reportedly betting on the four reactor power plant with an equivalent of a third of the country's total installed capacity to address power outages. In June, Morocco advanced its plan for nuclear energy after the release of a report that gives its legislators recommendations for making a switch to renewable energy sources. After the discovery of uranium deposits four years ago, Tanzania is also looking for help from Rosatom and its subsidy Uranium One, which has a license to mine uranium in the Mkuju River within the Sellers Game Reserve. Rwanda is also making significant strides after signing a deal with Rosatom to build a center of nuclear science and technologies by October 2029. DRC UN peacekeeping force MONUSCO leaves Butembo base after losing public support. The United Nations peacekeeping force in the Democratic Republic of Congo MONUSCO is evacuating its base in the eastern town of Butembo. Local civil society actors say they feel a sense of satisfaction and congratulate the population who mobilized as one to demand the unconditional withdrawal of the contingent. Anger has been fueled by perceptions that MONUSCO is failing to do enough to stop decades of armed conflict with more than 120 militias operating in the DRC's troubled east. UN bases in eastern DRC were assailed last month by protesters angered at MONUSCO's perceived failure to provide security. Deadly clashes broke out on August 23rd between DR Congo troops and an armed group at an empty UN base in the country's troubled east, officials have said. Two attackers were killed and four captured when the group struck the site in the city of Butembo. The UN peacekeeping force in the DRC had moved its troops out of the base following violent protests in late July. 32 demonstrators and four UN troops died over the course of a week-long disturbance, according to a Congolese toll. An estimated 120 armed groups roam eastern DRC, many of them a legacy of two regional wars that flared in the last decade of the 20th century. Among the most notorious are the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, which the self-described Islamic State claims as its regional affiliate, and the M23, whose resurgence has parked a diplomatic role between the DRC and neighboring Rwanda. On August 17th, the DRC authorities said MONUSCO had already left Butembo and that any remaining equipment in the city would be moved out. But MONUSCO then insisted that it was not leaving Butembo but momentarily suspending its operations. The city authorities published what they called a timetable for MONUSCO's planned deployment in Butembo, with traffic movements scheduled from August 20th to 24th. South Africa South Africa faces shutdown amid nationwide strike. Thousands of people across South Africa are taking part in a national strike in protest at the rising cost of living. Two of the country's largest unions are leading the strike, calling for a total shutdown of the economy in protest against high unemployment levels and rising fuel and electricity costs. Marches are expected in all provinces, with the largest rallies likely to be in Cape Town and Pretoria. The unions want a government cap on fuel prices as well as a drop in interest rates and an income grant. Around a third of South Africans are unemployed and the country is grappling with the economic impact of global events such as COVID and the war in Ukraine. While organizers of August 24th action say they aim to bring the country to an economic halt, they also acknowledge that numbers on the streets may not match similar shutdowns in previous years. The government says a no work, no pay principle will apply and essential workers cannot take part. But unions say they see this as a state of a series of actions they're willing to undertake until they get results. Nigeria U.S. to return 23 million U.S. dollars loot of Nigerian ex-military ruler. The United States government has signed an agreement with the federal government to repatriate 23 million U.S. dollars a batch of loot to Nigeria. The loot was stolen by the last general, Sani Abacha, and his cronies who ruled as the military head of state of Nigeria from 1993 until his death in 1998. 
He seized power on 17th November 1993 in the last successful coup d'etat in the military history of Nigeria. The agreement was signed on August 23rd at the office of Abubakar Malami, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, AGF. In his speech, Malami said the decision to return the stolen funds, which is tagged a batch of five, was a product of a series of negotiations and meetings between Nigeria, the U.S. Department of Justice and the United Kingdom UK National Crime Agency. The U.S. Ambassador noted that the funds would be used to complete infrastructural projects earlier mentioned by the AGF. She also added that the 311.7 million U.S. dollars previously seized and repatriated will be transformed into a visible and impactful representation of the possibilities of government assets that directly improve the lives of average Nigerians. Uganda Uganda to provide free Wi-Fi hotspots countrywide. Government will install 2,000 Wi-Fi hotspots across Uganda in a move that will extend internet access in far-flung areas. Speaking during the final review of the Regional Communications Infrastructure Program that started in 2016 and ends this year in Uganda, Dr. Hatrib Mugasa, the National Information Technology Authority Executive Director, said this is part of the Uganda Digital Acceleration Program that is awaiting cabinet approval. The free Wi-Fi hotspots installation program will be rolled out in every location where the government's national backbone infrastructure exists. Government has so far installed 600 Wi-Fi hotspots, with 300 of these situated in regional cities and another 300 in Kampala. The 75 million US dollars regional communications infrastructure program funded by the World Bank has registered significant gains with the government's plan to extend Wi-Fi across the country based on extension of the geographic reach of broadband connectivity across the country. The project has contributed to the extension of 764 kilometers of optical fiber cable added onto the government's national backbone infrastructure. Rwanda. Government regains control of upper airspace after 30 years. Rwanda will now have full control over her upper aerial space nearly five decades in the hands of the government of Tanzania. A handover deed was signed last week by both governments after Rwanda notified of her intention to withdraw and directly discharge her responsibility of providing air traffic services in her upper airspace. According to Rwanda Civil Aviation Authority, RCCA, the country's upper airspace was delegated to Tanzania in 1973 for provision of air traffic services. However, Tanzanian officials said to be able to regain her airspace, Rwanda fronted different reasons including improving safety in Kigali Flight Information Region, FIR, as well as meeting regulatory requirements such as search and rescue SAR obligations. Eventually, following several coordination meetings led by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, Rwanda was permitted to continue with the process to take over the airspace. Haiti. Haitians launch protest demands outset of president. Thousands of protesters in Haiti's capital and other major cities blocked roads, shut down businesses and marched through the streets on August 24th to demand that Prime Minister Ariel Henry step down and call for a better quality of life. Violence and kidnappings had surged in Port-au-Prince and nearby areas in recent months with warring gangs killing hundreds of civilians in their fight over territory. Violence has grown ever more powerful since last year's assassination of President Jovenel. In one protest, people wore black t-shirts while at another they wore red t-shirts emblazoned with the words, Rise Up. The protests come days after dozens of demonstrators staged a sit-in in front of Henry's official residence and demanded that he resign. On August 22nd, police clashed with demonstrators in some areas, firing tear gas to break up the crowd as burning tires blocked roads. Brazil Brazil vote, executives under scrutiny after coup charter. Weeks ahead of Brazil's presidential election, police carried out search warrants on August 23rd, targeting several business leaders who allegedly participated in a private chat group that included comments favoring a possible coup and military involvement in politics. 
The search and seizure warrants were issued by a Supreme Court justice who heads the nation's electoral authority, according to a statement from the federal police. They were aimed at prominent supporters of President Jair Bolsonaro, according to two of the people whose properties were searched and an official with knowledge of the operation. Many of the comments were speculative and appeared to reflect personal opinion rather than a coordinated effort to undermine Brazilian democracy. However, they fed into the national jitters over whether Bolsonaro's unsubstantiated allegations that the electoral system is vulnerable to fraud were laying the groundwork for a power grab if the vote doesn't go his way. According to the official with knowledge of the searches, the warrants targeted eight businessmen who appeared in a story last week on the online news site Metropolis, which published screenshots from their chat group on the WhatsApp messaging app. The person spoke on condition of anonymity because he wasn't authorized to speak publicly. In addition to issuing the search warrants, Justice Alexandra de Moraes ordered the businessmen's social media accounts to be blocked and their bank accounts frozen, the online site G1 reported. De Moraes also lifted seals on their banking records and authorized federal police to take depositions from the executives, the site reported. Ethiopia Fighting resumes in northern Ethiopia after a five-month lull. Fighting has erupted between government forces and Tigrayan rebels in northern Ethiopia on August 24th, shattering a five-month truce between the warring sides. The renewed warfare follows both sides repeatedly blaming the other for a lack of progress towards negotiations to end the brutal 21-month conflict in Africa's second most populous nation. The Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, said government forces and their allies had launched a large-scale offensive towards southern Tigray early August 24th after a month-long lull in fighting, but the government communication service has accused the TPLF of striking first, saying it had destroyed the truce. The March truce paused fighting in a war that first began in November 2020, allowing a resumption of international aid to war-stricken Tigray after a three-month break. Prime Minister Abi Ahmed's government and the TPLF have been locked in a war of words in recent weeks even as both sides have raised the prospect of peace talks. The two sides disagree on who should lead negotiations, and the TPLF also insists basic services must be restored to Tigray's 6 million people before dialogue can begin. Kenya Record 7 Kenyan female governors to be sworn in A record 7 female governors got sworn in on August 24th in Kenya following the recent elections in which a total of 45 regional governors were elected. The vote has ushered in a new wave of female leaders. Previously, there were only three women holding these influential positions. Governors are in charge of huge budgets and are expected to spearhead development in their counties. More than 20 female candidates had vied for the gubernatorial posts. Despite women making up nearly half of registered voters, very few female leaders hold elective positions. South Africa South African officials defend xenophobic comments. A South African provincial official has defended her comments that have blamed immigrant patients from Zimbabwe for burdening the country's public health system. The comments came to light after a video surfaced on social media of Health Minister Fofi Ramatuba chastising a Zimbabwean patient scheduled for surgery. In her defense, the minister said it was her responsibility to stand up for South Africans who depend on the public health system. The minister said long queues for surgeries were delaying a service for poor South Africans. The Zimbabwean patient was scheduled for surgery after reportedly being involved in an accident hundreds of miles away in her country's capital, Harare. Sudan U.S. sends first ambassador to Sudan in 25 years. The first American ambassador to Sudan to be appointed in 25 years has arrived in Khartoum. John Godfrey said in a tweet on August 25th that he was delighted to arrive in the northern East African nation. Godfrey was confirmed by the U.S. Senate as ambassador to Sudan last month. 
The career foreign service official has worked in countries across the Middle East and Northern African region, including Libya and Syria, in a counter-terrorism. His arrival in Sudan comes as the country suffers economic hardship and witnesses the launch of an initiative backed by the country's de facto leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, to end its political crisis. General Buhan led a coup last October that ousted a civil-led transitional government. Frequent protests calling for an end to military rule have been met by brutal violence from Burhan forces who have killed dozens of protesters. Relations between Sudan and the U.S. broke down after Omar al-Bashir came to power in 1989. The U.S. designated Sudan as a sponsor of the state terrorism in 1993 and suspended U.S. embassy operations in 1996. Washington reopened its Khartoum embassy in 2002, but with limited staff and no ambassador. Benin Benin unveils monuments to revive cultural pride, patriotism, and boost tourism. Benin is transcribing its history through artistic works recently inaugurated by the head of state Patrice Talon. Behind these monuments is a poignant story of personalities who have marked the Beninese culture through their work as builders. Bio Guerra, the Amazon and Obese League of the Duvo are now an integral part of the great whole that constitutes the national immovable cultural heritage of Benin in the city of Cotonou, the Beninese capital. Today, these monuments, which are undoubtedly a transmitter of emotion, cause a revival of pride and patriotism within the Beninese population. For the Beninese authorities, this political choice to put cultural wealth at the service of the country's tourism development is part of the implementation of the Government Action Program PAG 2021-2026. Burkina Faso Burkina Faso launches its first pharmaceutical production plant. Burkina Faso has built its first pharmaceutical production plant specializing in the production of generic drugs. Built by actors of the Burkina Bay private sector and named ProFarm, this factory erected on 1.5 hectares in the commune of Komsilga on the outskirts of the capital Ugadugu will ensure a permanent availability of the most requested medicines according to its promoters. The plant will start producing paracetamol 500 mg, fluoroglucinol and antipersmodic as well as well as a kit of oral rehydration salts and zinc for the treatment of diarrhea according to managing director amal koife the factory is currently finalizing the last step the inspection of the national agency for pharmaceutical regulation on the batches produced in order to obtain the marketing authorizations in the coming months usa African-American AP history being offered in 60 high schools as part of pilot program. A new pilot program has been introduced for 60 high schools to implement an advanced placement course in African-American studies. The College Board, the not-for-profit association behind America's AP courses, introduced the program, which is expected to add more schools to the roster in the pilot's second year. According to Education Week, the historic launch was a collaboration between the College Board, academic and cultural institutions, and African-American communities on the local and national level. Students will have access to the benefits of college-level coursework by excelling through the key connection to the African diaspora and will be the largest and most accessible high school course in the discipline, according to Ed Week. Students taking the course will study the Reconstruction Era, Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party's free breakfast and medical programs, as well as film and cultural contributions, including Marvel's Black Panther film. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, follow, share, and like our video. It's the best way of supporting us. And remember, Africa is watching.